Welcome to the Wednesday session of the World Justice Forum. Uh, I hope you all had an enjoyable evening last night. Uh, I know many of you uh, attended the screening of the movie uh, Presumed Guilty uh, last night, and uh, what a powerful statement uh, about the rule of, its, of law and its absence and the impact on uh, communities, on individuals. Um, really a, an outstanding uh, presentation, and I, I know uh, inspired and, and motivated many of us. Uh, I'm going to have some uh, housekeeping comments uh, at the end of our first uh, session this morning, so I will be coming back to you in, uh, in a little bit. Um, our plenary keynote uh, panel uh, this morning uh, deals with uh, a tremendously important issue, uh, freedom of the press, investigative reporting, um, uh, and it is led by my favorite political legal uh, reporter, uh, journalist, uh, Ethan Bronner, uh, who has had a distinguished career at the New York Times and now at Bloomberg News, uh, and he will lead our discussion uh, and, and get us off to a fast start this morning. Ethan. Thank you very much. Welcome to you all. Um, we'll each do short thingies, we'll converse, and then we'll bring you in, okay? So I... Um, spent many years at the New York Times. One of the jobs I did was to be the bureau chief in Jerusalem. And when I, uh, during those years from 08 to 12, I would go back to the United States a couple of times a year. Uh, and sometimes I would give speeches. And uh, one time before I left, an Israeli friend of mine sort of grabbed me by the shoulder and said, so you're going to America, to, you're gonna give speeches, who are you talking to? And I said, well, I talk to community groups, I talked to Jewish groups, I talked to college students, so he said, well, you listen to me, you tell those college students that Israel is not a racist, fascist, apartheid state. I said, okay, good, I will, and what shall I tell the Jewish groups? He said, tell them it is. <laughs> so, I tell you this because there are many ways to tell a story, and that doesn't excuse bad storytelling, but it does tell you that there's a role for the audience, there's a role uh, for a certain kind of advocacy in storytelling, but we're here to talk about credible, independent reporting. And like the legal profession, which many of you are in, journalists, at least those seeking doing the reporting as opposed to the opinion making, seek neutral terms. Try, we try to find a way to tell a story that both groups can understand and that has some meaning for them. Opinion side is kind of like lawyers being advocates, and reporting, I think, a done well, is sort of like lawyers being judges. Yesterday, Liz McGill of Stanford was asked, can you please tell us the importance of judicial independence? And she said, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with regard to this group, and I have that same impression here. The importance of independent, solid reporting seems to me something we can all in this room agree on. And if you saw the film last night, as Jim mentioned, you know the power of good reporting. It was an amazing development that, that that film helped create. And yesterday Liz said, there's a certain line you don't cross, and that line has been crossed with our current president, which is to attack the judge, him or herself, rather than the judgment or the reasoning behind the ruling. And we are now facing that as journalists in the United States as well, a direct attack on us and what we do, and as individuals as well. Uh, and that's something that I think that John will talk a little bit about. So we're here to talk about the importance of credible, independent journalism. It's about getting it right. And, you know, one of the things is like when, let's say, a blast goes off, then you immediately go into your sort of mode, if you're a reporter in the field, of what is it that you know and what you don't know. What can you report at that time? Is it a bomb? Is it an electrical failure? And it's at that moment, especially in our current world where the internet is so rapid, that everybody wants no, right now to have the details and you don't have them. And that's when everyone is most excited, you need to be most calm. There's a kind of Hippocratic oath of those of us who do this in the field. It doesn't mean we live up to it, but it is the, the oath that we take, and that is that we never publish something we don't know there is no higher truth that we're serving. There's no greater cause other than getting it right. 
I said that journalists are like lawyers, but we have a different code of ethics. For us, you know, I have a colleague named Matt Levine who's both a lawyer and a journalist, and he said, you know, if, if someone, if your client and your lawyer tells you, I killed someone, your job is to not tell anyone. As a journalist, your job is to tell everyone. Now, that's obviously a, a sort of gross exaggeration, but the idea is that we have different clients, and therefore, our code of ethics are not exactly the same. That doesn't mean there's pl not plenty of overlap. Free press is often viewed, especially I find this in the developing world, where there isn't a great deal of debate permitted, the free press is often viewed as the ability to express contrary opinions. And indeed, it's a very important part of the press. But what we're here to talk about, and in a certain way, I think the real contribution that journalism makes to democratic society and to the rule of law is to the creation of new facts, establishing things that people did not know through careful, serious, data-based and interview reporting. That's really what we try to do, uh, and that's what the people uh, up here are involved in. In the last six months since President Trump was elected, I think we've seen a kind of renaissance of the U.S. media, of much more vigorous involvement. I work for Bloomberg. We're working very hard at investigative stuff around the president and his businesses in ways I think it's fair to say that Bloomberg had not done before. And it's a complicated thing. On the one hand, I think it's terrific. We should all be proud of it. On the other hand, I think there is room to say, why did we have to wait for this to happen before we really started to hold the, a president's feet to the fire? And perhaps we failed to do it uh, under President Obama. I think that's a legitimate complaint of the conservatives uh, and something we should take seriously. We have a great panel with us. So each will talk for a few minutes, as I said, and then we'll have a conversation. Najiba Ayubi right here. I'm not going to tell you everything about everyone because their uh, bios are in the material that you've seen. She's the managing director of something called the Kilid Group, a journalist whose life has been threatened more than once. John Temple and I have basically said to one another, what are we doing up here? These two <laughs> people are the heroes. But, you know, they asked us to come up. We're here, right? The other, uh, be, just beyond Najib, is Uzgur Ugret. And Uzgur is uh, the Turkish representative, the Turkey representative of the Committee to Protect Journalists, also very involved in a time of enormous difficulty for journalists uh, in Turkey. And John Temple, who teaches investigative journalism at UC Berkeley uh, and has been uh, for many years uh, a very outstanding newspaper man in the United States. So I think I'll ask Najiba to begin. Each of us will speak for a few minutes and then we'll keep going. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, World Justice Project for uh, providing this opportunity to all of us to be together and talk about different things, which is uh, for uh, rule of law and also justice around the world. Uh, actually, Afghanistan have a history of more than 100 uh, years experience of free media. 100 be, uh, years before, there was a newspaper by the name of Saraj al Akbar. And then in 1921, we had the first woman media by the name of Ershad al Naswan. But after that, during decades and during regimes and during many years, it had an up and down situation. Sometimes uh, we had good freedom of expression, and sometimes it was in very low level. Uh, but we have the experience of a silence time, which was during Taliban. We had no voice in all over the country. Only one radio in one newspaper, which managed by Taliban, and all the content was managed by Taliban on that time. We had nothing else. But uh, in 2002, uh, 2001, after Taliban, there are a number of uh, media established, radios, TV channels, and also uh, free media. But in the back, when, uh, if we once look at Afghanistan uh, nascent history, uh, it, is, uh, it was a rare 
uh, before December 2001. But after 2001, we had another experience, uh, which has a lot of media was established, and now 10,000 people are working in media. Among them, 2,000 of them are women. But uh, during the history, the only uh, attempt uh, time which uh, our king, Zahir Shah, started to have this freedom of expression in the con Constitution, then uh, in 2000, uh, in, sorry, in uh, 1973, uh, the king time was entrapped by a coup from his cousin, and after followed by the communist regime, a communist uh, coup which uh, entrapped everything in uh, our country. When the uh, democratic era uh, ceased, Afghans uh, in general were victims of the opposing uh, extreme ideologies that looks over the, their life. Uh, the, sorry. the communist regime, backed by the Soviet Union, were oppressing and killing whoever even, uh, even do of opposing them. The Pakistan-backed Muslim Brothers was the main voice and channel for fighting the communists. Both ideas silenced the voices of moderation. Last but not least, the Taliban reigned over Afghanistan with their extremist ideology from 1996 to end of 2001. To make, the, uh, to make it simple, from July 1973 to December 2001, Afghans were not entitled to voice and could not express themselves freely. In early 2002, President Karzai, who at that uh, point was the head of the Afghan interim uh, authority, signed a freedom of uh, a speech and media decree that paved the route for the media scene that we witness today. After all these decades, the hardship, opposition, and uh, absence of uh, basic freedom, it wasn't an easy task for Afghans to suddenly think freely or uh, spoke freely. The very nature of the, those who come along President Karzai and those who lost power slowly, slowly recreated the same conflict and insecurity and the polarization of the uh, political climate. In this, political cli um, in this polarized, polarized political climate, which has become the name the norm in Afghanistan, credible independent reporting become a very difficult. As a result, Afghanistan has lost, lost more than 50 journalists uh, in the past 16 years. Those uh, journalists, both men and women, were the victims of the ideological extremism. Given this uh, tense, climate in Afghanistan uh, unbiased reporting become rare. Many of the media, media groups in the country are aff affiliated with, with or influenced by varying political actors and ideologies. Furthermore, these media, media groups from time to time act against independent media whose work directly or indirectly uh, promotes democratic ideals and human rights. Uh, Radio Khalid, which is uh, uh, our group, uh, is, uh, we have a depth uh, investigative reporters team, which always uh, they are working to challenge the people that in government that uh, the uh, people in government and, all, and also institutions who let corruption grow 
or the mayor who is uh, favoring warlords or power brokers. Uh, Ridicule often received direct and indirect threats for its content, and our reporters have faced lots of harassment around the country, and especially in Kandahar uh, province. Our station driver had his nose chopped off by the Taliban to, uh, to intimidate us. Independent media reporting in Afghanistan faces a lot of uh, challenges from the power hubs that exist in country, throughout the country. There are key political figures and key, politi and key uh, provinces that have cultivated the certain image of themselves in order to assert their influence. As a part of their efforts to preserve a certain uh, persona, they also have the influence, the media, uh, of their image to, uh, uh, image. to that uh, extent, they maintain uh, relations with journalists in order to control the uh, circulation of information but also to ensure that there is never any negative portrayal or their image or any reporting of their uh, mistakes in uh, traditional and social media. For, for example, certain political figures in the Afghan government pay a group of Afghan influencers, unfortunately known as a Facebook drivers, uh, to positively shape the public opinion about them through social media. <coughs> Therefore, in this type of political uh, environment, journalists or media groups that do take the risk of negatively portraying uh, the key po um, political figures do so at the um, risk of losing their livelihood or even their life. I can count on one hand the number of credible independent media outlets existing in Afghanistan among us the hundreds of their media outlets that are influenced by the government, the opposition, insurgents group, and special interested groups. Uh, the media who want to remain independent and work for the general public interest, not only to they face uh, pressure from the government and certain opposition groups, they also experience intimidated from uh, certain insurgent groups such as Taliban, ISIS, Haqqani group, and others. Radio Khalid's local station have, uh, have been the victim of these uh, pressures from insurgent groups. For uh, example, Daesh or ISIS exploded two bombs at our one of Eastern Province radio station by the name of Nangarhar in, in August 2015. Uh, after we uh, they did this because we consistently uh, refused to broadcast their messages. Then um, Afghanistan, uh, nascent free media in, uh, industry is only 16 years old and uh, therefore very vulnerable to outside uh, pressures. Within this uh, industry, the independent, unbiased media is even more vulnerable. Therefore, we desperately need the support, of, uh, sol support and the uh, solidarity of the global independent media and the international democratic community in order to continue our work to raise awareness on key issues and give the public 
their rightful access to information. Wise words. Thank you, Najiba. Uzgur. Good morning. Uh, my name is Özgür Evret. I am the Turkey rep representative for the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, my job is monitoring everything in Turkey uh, that is related to press freedom, uh, which unfortunately, uh, gives me job security for the foreseeable future. Because uh, most of you may know, Turkey uh, has never had a brilliant press freedom record. But since last year, uh, we are two days away from the anniversary of the failed, a failed coup d'etat. Uh, since then, the crackdown on uh, Turkey's press has reached to uh, worst levels ever seen. And in our profession, uh, words like most, worst, uh, the best, etc., these are dangerous words. Uh, therefore, uh, please know that I'm not using this lightly. Uh, even before the coup, uh, the government has started shutting down the media outlets that uh, they don't like and liquidating their assets uh, to the treasury. After the failed coup d'etat, which our President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has called a blessing from Allah, uh, this has been done in a uh, more rapid uh, and excessive way. Over a hundred media outlets uh, and publishing houses, um, television channels, newspapers, magazines, uh, radio channels have been uh, shut down uh, since then. And these are not all related uh, to the uh, religious group that the government is uh, accusing uh, to be responsible uh, of the coup. This includes pro-Kurdish media outlets, this includes leftist outlets, uh, to a degree that uh, in Turkey, uh, Anybody, not just journalists uh, at this point, can be uh, prosecuted as a journalist over almost nothing. When we are using social media, again, mostly journalists, but not only, uh, only uh, journalists, uh, we are aware that we may as well as be writing our own indictments when writing a Facebook post or writing a tweet. Because uh, the um, practice is so arbitrary that, for example, despite my job, I have never been uh, prosecuted or even uh, a legal investigation has been started against me. But uh, people who have written maybe one sarcastic tweet or uh, retweeted one undesirable person may end up in jail. So uh, it is uh, this uncertainty, uh, it can be discussed, that is the worst of all. Because you don't know which step you will take, maybe a misstep. And uh, in such an atmosphere, there are very few uh, independent media outlets left in Turkey. Uh, mostly, uh, it's... Uh, independent reporting is on the uh, internet, which really does not reach everybody because television uh, remains the most important news source in Turkey. And those who uh, do uh, try to uh, do their jobs correctly uh, are always uh, feeling that uh, the next day may be the day they, uh, they could be arrested and they may not know why they were arrested uh, for weeks, uh, sometimes months. Uh, and um, to, um, to summarize it all, uh, in Turkey, uh, independent journalism uh, has been struck 
uh, a very hard bl uh, blow uh, since uh, last year's failed coup attempt, which is used, an, uh, used as an excuse uh, to uh, calm down our all media. And the few ones, uh, the few independent journalists and media outlets who left standing meets a lot of support and interest from the world. Thank you. John. Good morning. It's an honor to be on the same panel as Uzgur and Najiba. And of course, Ethan has had his own uh, courage in reporting from abroad. I'm much more uh, a stay-at-home American journalist from the center of the country in many ways. Most of my career was as a newspaper editor in New Mexico and Colorado. So I can speak about uh, journalism in the United States. Today I'm um, the director of an investigative program at Berkeley whose mission is to uh, expose, report stories that expose injustice and abuse of power while we're training the next generation of journalists in the highest standards. So we try to teach those standards. And maybe the contribution I can make here is, is related somewhat to Roberto's film last night, and I hope those of you who didn't see it have the chance to see it, because often when we talk about journalism, we think about coverage of the halls of power, Washington, Moscow, the places where the decisions are made. But the reality is, is life plays out on the ground, and we saw it in the movie, the, light, uh, the reality, the world, the policies and the practices set by government actually play out in a courtroom, in a, in a very depressing courtroom in that case, in Mexico. And, and I think um, when we're thinking about independence journalism, we should be thinking about uh, uh, where we can reveal how the policies actually affect real people. And that's what we saw. And the power of that journalism was that when people see it and are exposed to it, and when the government realizes that the people see what's really happening, it can cause change. And I think, um, you know, we hear that the one of the roles of journalists is to show the world in such a way that people can change the world. I, I think we all want to make the world a better place. I think that's part of the contribution of journalists. Um, obviously, uh, one of the reasons I'm very troubled by the present state of journalism in the United States, we're clearly not in any, we don't face the dangers and the threats that you face every day. But it is a dangerous time in America one reason that I don't know if everybody here knows it's such an international audience is the economics of journalism and particularly of local journalism are broken. And there isn't the money to support what has historically been a vibrant local press. And why that is important is um, while you can have coverage of a, a sort of a, at a national level and you see the New York Times and the Washington Post and Bloom, these major entities thriving, Local organizations that can report what's really happening to somebody on the ground in his or her community and expose um, what's happening in the daily life of the United States are struggling. And that's happening at, at, a at the same time as uh, we have a government that is, is uh, uh, th threatening um, journalists. On the political and legal front, we see... Uh, our own president is an oligarch. He's, he's backed by a slew of essentially reactionary American oligarchs who've helped put him into power. And what do they do? They cast us as the enemy of the people. I mean, I have a t-shirt I could have worn on the stage today that is the enemy of the people. And, and that is dangerous. He uses Twitter and his own rallies to stir up fury against journalists. And and we've become um, the enemy for a minority who, who are angry, and they've lost, and he plays on their loss of status, their loss of income, their loss of dominance in what is becoming a much more multicultural and multi-ethnic society. Um, unlike in Afghanistan or Turkey or in other countries, 
Our journalists are rarely assassinated or imprisoned, uh, but we see people warming to the likelihood of conflict, and we also see that our, 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 the powerful, including our president, including uh, oligarchs who support him, um, Sheldon Adelson and others, use the courts to try to silence publications they don't like. And the danger um, um, about the, the decline in the economics is the news organizations are not as strong as they once were to fight those legal challenges. They don't have the resources. For those of you who don't live in the United States, you know, the anger that we're seeing in our country is something we haven't seen, I don't think, since the 1960s. And as it was then, in the 1960s, some of you may remember uh, the term nattering nabobs of negativity. Uh, the Repub then Republican vice president directed venom towards the press, and again, the venom appears to be coming almost entirely from one side of the political spectrum. And while, we, while I believe the First Amendment still makes uh, uh, us, the United States, a model of press freedom, we are seeing the creation of a partisan press, uh, 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 in, in some ways a one-party press, um, with Fox News and others, uh, Breitbart and others, Infowars, acting as almost house organs of the ruling party, where we effectively have um, organs that work in tandem, which I would not describe as an independent press, which suggests we may be headed more towards a reality um, of your countries rather than the aspirations of our own. We've actually seen a, re a congressman, a congressional candidate, beat up a reporter, physically assault a reporter, and attack him for asking a question, and the next day he was elected to Congress, which gives you an idea of the uh, madness uh, I think we're seeing. And I think uh, there's a, a fear among many of us that the violence will get worse. So um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there's nothing can, we can do. I mean, I think we're here to talk about the powerful benefits of the press like those we saw last night. And I think the critical thing we can do is reveal what's really happening in our country and in the world rather than what the powerful want the public to think or believe. That's our role in building a, a civil society, exposing how and why we ended up where we are and what we can do to improve our lot. And unlike um, in some of the discussion in the United States today, I do believe facts matter. I do believe there are uh, facts that we can um, agree on. And that's the, that is our essential role, as Ethan discussed. I mean, obviously, the ability to express a range of opinion, to be imprisoned for retweeting a hostile tweet is so outrageous, it's unthinkable. But um, our role is greater than to express a hostile tweet. It is to tell people things that make them understand their society and be able to create a better society for themselves and, and make their own decisions. And um, they, the pub, this is, it's critical, and what we're seeing in the United States is that the public is losing trust in part through what the president and others are saying about the press. Um, the public is losing trust in us, and they, it's critical that the public understand or believe, I think, that our loyalty is not to party or power, but to truth. I mean, it has to be to truth. And, and that means to them, because it means we have no obligation to anyone else but to tell them, to the best of our knowledge, what is true and what we don't know as well. And so my practical solution, and probably the best solution I can offer to defend freedom of speech and the press is not to let the opposition define the debate. And it, I think it's time for us as journalists to be much more transparent about our own work. We can't expect the public to, to, to understand our work by saying our work will speak for itself. We actually have to talk about what we do, why we do it, what are the values behind it, 
what we've gone through to do the work. I mean, if you think about last night's film, one of the things that was so powerful was to hear from Roberto afterwards and hear him talk about the experience. And I think there's a hunger that we're seeing actually in the United States for people to understand what went into the story, what doubts people had, what, what wrong paths they took. And so I think um, one major step we can do is be much more um, communicative about the decisions and struggles uh, that we have. And we can see that if you think about the past presidential election, the most sort of um, recognized reporter was David Farenthold of the Washington Post, who is a former colleague of mine. And one of the things that he did, which so distinguished his work and was so different from what you would have thought about from the Washington Post of even just a few years ago when we worked together was, he asked for the assistance of the readers in getting to the truth. He shared the process and the work with the readers and he invited them to participate. And, and they were along on the journey and they, and they contributed. And he continues to do that today. So I think that kind of openness in our own work is critical if we're gonna demand openness and accountability in government. Um, because the public needs to see, I think we have to exemplify that our, our request and our demand that government be transparent and accountable isn't for our own sake so we can make a living as journalists. It's because it's fundamental to a free society that there be transparency and openness and it's for them actually that we're working. You know, and finally, just one other solution I would say, and maybe this is coming from not working always in Washington or New York or LA is pack journalism is not going to be what um, uh, transforms our society. If you think about Roberto's story, there was no other reporter there with Tonio when covering that trial. Um, it's important that reporters head out on their own and tell their own stories away from the pack. And I think when that happens, you get profoundly human and profoundly uh, deep stories or the potential for those kinds of stories. You move away from sound bites. And I think um, many Americans may be familiar with, but, with this, but you know, Jefferson was asked about newspapers and said about newspapers, he said, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. No matter what our current president says, I think that's the, the truth and it's a test of a society, the freedom of the press and what, and what we're able to contribute to it. So thank you for thank you, having me speak to you today. So the, what has happened in the United States with the relationship to the media in the last six months has, has sort of forced us to understand that there be maybe greater continuity with what's going on in your countries uh, than we had thought just a year ago. And the thing that seems to me problematic is while you say, while you say, while you say, free press, a full disclosure is what everybody needs, what society needs, apparently not everyone agrees. And it turns out not just those in power disagree, but sometimes those who are not in power disagree. Yesterday, the question of ritual and culture came up in the question of the rule of law. And I think that the free press is the central part of the rule of law, the central part of this question. So Najiba and Uskurt, I want you to talk a little bit about what it, in your own society, in your own families, is there resistance to the idea of transparency of information of a breaking down of social hierarchies. How did you end up believing what you believe? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm coming from a country that is uh, most tough. And this is 39 years I'm living in war. Actually, I am the war generation. I was a child when the war started. I spent all my life studying everything in, during the war, and now I'm getting old and war is still there. It is very difficult to, to live in such a country. Uh, 
Regarding uh, myself, I started working in journalism from that time, which was in seven class of school, seven grade of school. I started working with my uh, local newspaper because it was the only media in my society. I started the cooperation with this uh, newspaper. But let me, let me interrupt you for a second. How did your family view what you were doing? Uh, I am coming to that. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> my family was uh, fortunately uh, opposite of a lot of people in Afghanistan. I had an open mind father mm -hmm. and a very supportive mother. And now I was the elder uh, uh, child of family and the others followed me. In the beginning, my father was very supportive of his daughters, and even he lost his life because of our education. Mujahideen killed my father because he was allowed his children, especially the girls, to go and educate inside of Afghanistan and outside of Afghanistan. He lost his life. This is a value for me forever, and I never uh, forgot the, the things that my father did for us. Uh, fortunately, I have a very supportive family until now, and my husband's family also, are, are, I'm very proud of them, that they always are supporting me. But it has not happened for all. I know a lot of uh, women uh, journalists that they are graduating from faculties of journalism, but they are going and become teachers because their family are not allowed them to go and become a journalist and work as a journalist because this area is uh, risky and also it needs a lot of time and a lot of independence and this and that. Uh, the society I am living, as uh, you told, uh, all the people are not agree with this uh, kind of freedom that we want. A lot of them are uh, opposite of this idea because they are losing their benefit in this. And a lot of them are challenging by, uh, by journalists. But uh, the most uh, population of Afghanistan like this freedom and they are really trust journalism in Afghanistan. And uh, some service shows after, uh, I think after police or after army, the people of Afghanistan trusting journalists. And they, they think uh, they, the journalists are their uh, eyes and their voice. And that is why uh, we have, the journalists of Afghanistan have support of uh, common people of Afghanistan. And this is a value for us and we, we are trying to keep it and never lose it. Uzgur, what about in Turkey? I mean, I, I think there's a greater secular tradition. In fact, what has happened right uh, with AKP in the last 20 years has been to sort of reimpose uh, almost a ritualistic or religious outlook on society. But I'm wondering, you know, how we deal with the problem of not just that Erdogan doesn't want you to do it, but that his supporters are in some way anti-press, if I'm right. Well, I'm not too comfortable uh, with uh, talking about uh, everyday politics uh, of Turkey as uh, the CPJ representative of the country, but I can say that in Turkey we have a general problem and it's that everybody loves democracy. Everybody loves freedoms, but for themselves <laughs> and for uh, other people they like. That's the uh, kind of the problem. You. Uh, must have all heard of uh, the uh, famous story with King Solomon and dividing the baby. Let me uh, tell you something a little more, uh, a little less known. Uh, two villages were always fighting. There was an ongoing conflict, so they went to the king to solve their problem. The king said to the uh, residents of the first village, I will give you whatever you want, but I will give the other village twice as whatever you get. So what do you want? They discussed a little bit among themselves and then said, blind us all, all in one eye. <laughs> it is uh, kind of, uh, this is kind of uh, our problem. Uh, I wouldn't say for everybody, but for majority, we have red lines for freedoms, red lines for democracy. That may change, but the red lines are always there. 
that's uh, kind of uh, our general situation. And do you, I understand you don't want to get into the politics of the CJP stays rigidly neutral about it, but do you, I mean, the fact that there is a kind of anti-press freedom part mm -hmm. to popular culture right now, what do you attribute it to? specifically in Turkey? Well, the, our political leaders have constantly been demonizing uh, both local opposition media and the foreign media. Uh, and uh, if you take a taxi in Istanbul or talk to local artisans in anywhere else, and uh, the moment you say foreign journalist, I know because I also worked a lot as a fixer for foreign journalists, uh, there, uh, first opinion uh, is they are spies, they come to uh, write bad things about our country, mm -hmm. they are uh, hostile to our nation, etc. And uh, it is impossible to deny that uh, the government for, at all levels have been demonizing the press uh, for years. Uh, that's the uh, primary reason. And Najiba, go back to you for one minute. Actually, Media freedom has slightly improved in Afghanistan recently, is that right? Uh, yes, of course. The, the freedom of expression which we have during the 16 years, it was not happen in, in whole Afghan history. It is uh, good, but it is uh, not an easy job. We didn't get it for free. We, had, we lost a lot of uh, our colleagues, men and women, uh, foreign journalists in Afghanistan and also national and uh, citizen uh, journalists in Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, the freedom we have now, comparing to some of our, our neighbors, it is uh, very good, but not enough. In some cases, still we have uh, some taboos we can talk about. We uh, still we have something which is very difficult to talk about. Still, we have self-censorship in Afghanistan because there is no protection from government side. And uh, the journalists uh, that they want to cover the sensitive topics, they have to take the risk themselves or the group or the media that they are working in. Uh, that is why uh, it is a lot, but not and enough. And what, what, what are one or two examples of the most sensitive topics that people are afraid to touch? Uh, in our case, in an uh, investigative report that we are working on, it is uh, corruption, it is crimes of war, it is transitional justice, social protection, women rights, and human rights. Oh, this just things, those. <laughs> just that little group of issues. <laughs> these, these things is very sensitive and we get a lot of threats, uh, my group and myself especially. And these threats come from different groups that uh, we are challenging them with our reports. Uh, among these uh, um, people that threaten us, it is uh, oppositions like uh, Taliban, like uh, we also treated by um, police. In one case, I had a very tough uh, um, conversation or get threat from uh, head of Kabul police and also MPs, which they are MPs and also they have gunmen. Uh, in 2012, two of them came in front of my house and want to kill me, kill me or arrest me, I don't know. But I uh, told them a lie. I said in the back of the door, I said, she's not at home. The person asked, who are you? I said, I'm his ma her mother. And uh, this was a very bad experience on that time. And after that, we went to, to um, find another way to protect ourselves. That's why in 2012, we created a, a consortium, a media consortium, which is around 32 radio stations, one TV, one very famous news agency by the name of Pajwak, and a very famous newspaper of Afghanistan by the name of uh, Eight Morning or Ashtasop, uh, and also Nawa and Sabah Sabo TV and Nawa Radio. We come together to when we, we, one of us produce sensitive reports, we, this media which I, I named them, together we broadcast or publish it in one day to be not very uh, fast targeting. And Najiba, give me an example of an issue that the media have been able to cover 
that has made some kind of a difference in Afghanistan. I mean, those issues you talked about, human rights, women's rights, corruption seem pretty central. Are there smaller things that the press has been able to work on to make a difference? Uh, yes, as I uh, told you, there is uh, religion things. We never touch it. It is a taboo. The sexual things, it is very difficult. We, you have to be very careful if you cover a sexual harassment uh, topic. This is uh, two things. And also, there is a big uh, mafia, mafia of land, mafia, economical mafia, and also land mafia, and uh, drug mafia, trafficking, dr drug trafficking mafia. And uh, journalists know a lot of things about them. But because they have no protection, they are doing self-censorship. And I'm, they are I'm not touching you, this thing. Right, but I'm asking case. you, what do you touch? What are topics that the press has been able to make a difference in Afghanistan? Actually, we are trying to uh, cover everything which happened in, in our country. But it is very difficult for editor-in-chiefs when we give some topic, some sensitive topic to the reporters, and especially when they live in the provinces, uh, a lot of the time they are playing with the topic and they are not going to cover it very well because they are afraid. One time uh, I gave a topic to an investigative report in, in north of Afghanistan. It was the, uh, about crimes of war. And he uh, didn't uh, complete it during month. And some, I become angry and talk with him by uh, phone and said, why you are not completing your report during one month? She's, uh, he said, uh, Ms. Ayubi, I want to say you the reality. It is very difficult. The, the topic is very sensitive. If I uh, cover it, Sometimes they, uh, uh, they will kill me by a car accident. Then they show that the car, it was a car accident. And that is why I want to remain alive and I want to uh, be uh, with my family and my children and this and that. This kind of issue is coming up a lot, but we are uh, doing to use different techniques. And sometimes we are changing the name of the people. Sometimes we are not named the place of the people. But we are covering the things. And it is, uh, at all, it, become, it is a challenge in Afghanistan. Indeed. John, I want to ask you a little something. So you do investigative work. And a lot of what has um, fed investigative journalism is the availability of data that wasn't always so available. One of the things that I think there's been a kind of identity crisis in the United States among journalists is the fact that we missed that Trump was going to win the election. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you, you know, A, whether you think it's fair to say we missed it, and B, if so, do you think it's uh, partly that there was a reliance on data and not enough getting out and talking to people. I'm, I'm, if that's not what you think, push back. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think that's certainly one critique that um, there was this idea that uh, American media didn't go out into the heartland and discover uh, the anger and the distress in Michigan and Pennsylvania and um, Wisconsin, Indiana. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's really... Uh, the, the kind of reporting that would have made a difference because in some ways you argue about the, this presidential election, the free television time that Trump was able to use to his own advantage, and in, in fact, I think it was Les Moonves of, of CBS News said, uh, Trump may not be great for America, but he's really great for CBS News, or something to that effect. Right. Because from an economic standpoint, he's a ratings machine, and a ratings machine means you make more money. True. And so I think there's a conflict in U.S. journalism right now where the owners of the media are, are profiting from this president, actually. And they're also in fear of this president in the sense that he's exhibited a willingness to use his office to punish businesses or to promote businesses that align with him. 
uh, that's a very dangerous and, and scary, scary thing. And, um, and it's sort of new, so I think, I think you're seeing, you know, you describe a rejuvenated press, and, and, but I think on the business side, I wonder if that's really rejuvenated or if it's really like we're angling to get what we can in this, in, in this environment. So I don't, uh, I think there were mistakes. I, I think there was a great failure of, of the press in Trump in the sense that I don't think journalists took Trump as seriously. I think the New York Times had a full-time reporter on Hillary Clinton three years before the election. Uh, Donald Trump's also from New York City, and, she, you know, and it took forever for them to really get rolling on, on, on Donald Trump. And, um, but I mean, there's a paradox here because by rolling on Donald Trump, it did mean giving him airtime and letting him talk and letting us hear him. And on the one hand, you're saying by doing so, you're helping him. On the right. other hand, you're saying, come on, you got to cover the guy. Well, because, because I think the, in particular, you know, CNN and, and Fox and MSNBC gave him so much unadulterated airtime without commentary. It was just sort of like, let's hear from Trump, who's a, a great... Um, and you think they should not have done that? I think there should have been more independent reporting of the type that you're describing, which is actually scrutinizing who is this man, I mean, who is this man, what has he done versus what he says he's done, those kinds of stories, then watching him give another speech or waiting for him to appear on the podium. And you think it would have made a difference to his voters? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, by the way, I don't think that if it doesn't, it's not still an yeah, obligation. Right, I'm just asking. Right. I, I guess for, for me, I think we, th we see things now, I think you go back and say, the New York Times used to have a meter on its homepage every day about the likelihood of Trump or Clinton. Is that really journalism? Is that really, like, predictive? I, I learned, one, I wrote a column once, this is during the first Bush administration. You're old. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a column saying about this uh, terrible policies on acid rain, and it turned out that actually, you know, I was wrong. And I, I learned from that experience that predictive journalism is really the worst kind of journalism because you have no ability. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, but what you do know is what is happening. And if you can describe, rather, what's happening to the forest, but this idea that you know what all the policy changes and the... Ch but, I mean, are you, I agree that the, that little meter that appeared every yeah. day uh, on the Times webpage was, sort, was, in the end, weirdly misleading because, A... Well, it wasn't wrong. It just right. said there's an 80% chance or right. whatever, and the 20% took it. And any time, 20% can take it. But are you, I mean, the other thing is that when you have this information, you feel an obligation to share it. Right. And, you know, so, I mean, maybe the problem is people don't know what it means, and I'm not sure it would have made a difference in the election. It would have made a difference maybe in people's emotions when <laughs> she lost. But I'm not sure it would have made a difference in the vote. Well, I think then it gets to the question of, um, how adversarial, it's, it's really the same question you're talking about in Afghanistan. How willing are you going to be to call, uh, to be truthful and harshly truthful? I, I mean, a six times bankrupt casino owner, I mean, it's hard to go bankrupt in the casino industry. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and somebody who had a long record of, of business dealings that were um, questionable, you know, in terms of his transactions. Uh, you wonder, um, I think the Times and other national publications in particular are wrestling with, um, are we going to be seen as adversaries of, of the government or are we going to be seen as honest brokers? And um, y your danger is you could be seen as an adversary of the government and, you, and then you, you become in, into trouble. Mm -hmm. In our case, I think the journalism organizations are worried that as adversaries... They'll lose uh, credibility. They'll lose the ability to obtain advertising. I mean, one of the most interesting things that's happened is sort of a citizen's movement campaign against Breitbart to force advertisers off Breitbart mm -hmm. because Breitbart is perceived in one way. So you drive advertising off Breitbart because they are clearly positioned as an adversary um, or as a proponent of, of, of the government <coughs> in their case. So I think um, the ownership of news organizations, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if we would say they're as courageous as necessarily. And now we're in a situation where, you know, you talk about threats to journalists. I mean, we clearly have threats to journalists in the United States from the highest 
levels of government. That's really, really unusual. Mr. Gray, I want to ask you about whether you think we are... One <coughs> argument has been that the internet and social media has kind of accelerated polarization and made uh, false news, you know, not knowing whether something is true, worse. Yeah. Do you think that's true? Because it is, I would imagine if you were to look at newspapers from 100 years ago in all of our countries, you'd find a, a lot of not such great information and a lot of <laughs> slanted information, right? So has it made it worse, do you think? I, I have a fear that comes uh, before that, before uh, worrying about false news, and that's censorship. Censorship. Because when somebody <laughs> talks about what we will do about banning the fake news, I automatically think that how this will be used in banning the actual news. Because uh, I believe censorship, uh, if it gets its foot on the door, you cannot stop it. That's why, for example, it happened in my country, internet censorship, when it comes, it's being sold with, we will prevent pornography. Not sold, we will prevent child pornography, etc. Well, okay, you ban pornographic sites in Turkey, but uh, the laws that you said uh, you made for these are used for banning actual news, mm -hmm. shutting down uh, actual m uh, media outlets. So, uh, relative to your question, uh, in my country, uh, partisan media is not actually seen a problem. It's part of our culture. Right. W whether if you are socialist, liberal, religious, secularist, Turkish media culture is kind of partisan. But do you need to I read four newspapers to know what happened yesterday? Excuse do you need to read four different newspapers? Yes, we used to. When we had uh, newspapers with different opinions had right. existed. Right. Uh, seven years ago when I was working at a daily newspaper, I was reading 10 to 12 newspapers and then... <laughs> 10 uh, to 12? Yeah, yeah. I, I was reading uh, a, the same story in 10 <laughs> newspapers and, okay, this, that, uh, there are these guys, so they would cover that. There <laughs> then I would have an idea of what's going, what's going on. Today we don't have that because uh, the most of the media uh, with dissenting voices are banned. So to shortly answer your question, I'm worried more about the methods of fighting fake news, false news, than false news themselves. I'm going to turn to the audience in one minute, but I want to go back to culture one more time with you, Najib. So it, you did explain that your own family has been extremely supportive and that has really helped you be who you are. Yes. But and so, what, I, what I'd like to know is, do you talk to young women or to young people generally ever in Afghanistan and face a kind of resistance to the idea of a flattening of hierarchy, of the availability of information, what you, that what you do is good? Do people, young people say to you, no, you shouldn't violate certain strictures in society? Does everybody support what you do? What's the reaction to what you do when you talk to young people? Um, actually, um, the most uh, colleagues of mine are youths. And 300 reporters working with me among the 700 people that was working in the NGO I'm running, the media, and also the uh, schools, uh, 300 of them are journalists, and most of them are youths. Youth meaning in their 20s? In, yes, between 20 to 32, 34, right. these um, people. Um, actually, I, I didn't face uh, any difficulties or any uh, opposite uh, opinion mm -hmm. about this, uh, what I'm doing. In one, two case, uh, when I joined the Kilit group in 2004, uh, when I entered the newsroom, because uh, uh, I don't know that dressing or something was uh, a little different, then a lot of uh, my colleagues, which now they are my very near friends, some of them are left our group, some of them are remain, uh, they saw differently to me. It, it, it seemed, uh, to me, it seemed that 
they are not agree with the kind of dressing and when sometime I'm not hearing the uh, scarf and these things, it was very difficult uh, time. And then slowly, slowly they get habit and they work with me and I was their manager and the first, uh, culturally it was very difficult for most of them to accept a woman came and become their manager. Then slowly, slowly they, they get habit and I work very close, closely with them and I uh, work with them, I cooperate with them, I help them during their works and they were happy. Uh, now I have not these uh, difficulties. In one case, uh, there was a reporter, we hired him. Uh, he came from Pakistan, he was Afghan, uh, live in Pakistan and he came to our group. For a few months he worked with us, but he was very weak. I, I tried a lot to uh, help him, but it was not possible. Fi uh, finally, we asked him to resign because it is not possible uh, to work with you anymore. Then when he resigned, uh, he went to the door and collected a lot of our my colleagues and said, it is a shame for you, you are working under managerial of a woman. <laughs> It was <laughs> the only experience I have. I remember the name of the reporter, the face, everything. Uh, this was the only two things I uh, that faced. Was being but a woman, other, yeah. uh, I'm very comfortable with the things I'm doing. Wonderful. I'm good doing. Okay, so I think there are microphones that will come to you if you raise your hand and I will call on you. Sir, right here in the middle. If you just wait one minute, a mic will come. The New York Times is one of the many international newspapers that has been sued by my country for defamation. And all these newspapers lost in these defamation suits 100% of the time. The target today is not professional journalists or press freedom because all the newspapers, all the television stations, all the radio stations belong to two companies that are effectively controlled or owned by my government. Today, the target is amateur journalists, ordinary citizens, bloggers. We have had so many new laws against freedom of expression. Our fake news law is coming out soon. There are so many things that you cannot write about. You I'm cannot sure. write about ongoing court case, an ongoing police investigation. Which country are you from? Singapore. Singapore. Deemed as harassment to a person or organization, defamation, our prime minister sued a blogger for defamation. He had to pay $179,000 in damages at and legal costs. Do you want to ask a question yes. to someone? Please. Just 10 seconds more and then I'll give the question. Two bloggers were jailed for eight and 10 months. Please. Can you give some advice to the amateur journalists in my country? Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. What do you say, well, I mean, Mr. S Committee to Protect Journalists? Or maybe you'll well, start, John. That's fine. Doesn't uh, a, a, a situation like that, it's best to know to learn how to hide yourself in the web. <laughs> I think that's essential. I, I think that's right. I think bringing in international assistance to train people about how to anonymize themselves in that context is really valuable. And, and, and um, there are people who would help with that, don't you think? A, a kind of updated sure. Sami's dot, right? Yes. With, I mean, essentially. In the Soviet era. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know uh, the. You know, I, I don't know enough about the political structure and the, uh, but the the digital structure there. But I think um, there are tools that you can use to hide yourself as you're publishing. A Tor browser, yes, uh, Tails, well, things like that. And let me uh, shamelessly advertise here: CPJ as a digital security guide, online yeah. available, explaining <laughs> all these, sending you to the right sources. Okay. And there are organizations that I think would help in sending individuals or, mm -hmm. or, or teaching for that kind of thing. Um, I'd like to follow up on a comment that John made earlier in terms of uh, the profit motives of news media. There was a time in the 50s, perhaps maybe into the 60s, 
where networks felt that uh, news could be a loss leader, um, that they didn't need to make a profit on it. And, and we've had a, a total switch of that and sort of an advent of info, it, it, it's sort of entertainment news um, on, on most of the networks in the United States. And I wonder if you can comment on whether or not there's any hope for changing that. John, take it if you would, um, since you raised it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are probably the two leading papers in terms of covering national politics there, are both for-profit organizations. And, um, and um, I think there's a, a place for for-profit and non-profit, so I don't see um, profit as, as necessarily the problem. I think what you're describing is, is that in the case of television, in the United States, you were licensing an airwave, a public, um, you, were, you were licensing to a private interest something that was public. You were, you were, you were essentially giving a, a benefit to an individual or corporation. And I think we came to an idea in the 60s, uh, I was lucky enough recently to be able to be exposed to Newton Minow and came to the, came to the idea that there, there, that there was a responsibility that came with having this license to use the airwaves. We get to the 80s and um, cable news and suddenly the idea uh, that um, we don't need to have any kinds of rules because there's a uh, diversity of, of channels, and so suddenly you're, you're not so restricted anymore. And the danger with that was that the responsibility portion of the, of, of, the, uh, ex, the, of the requirement, of the expectation with the license, fell out the window, and then we get to the uh, digital, because really today, I mean, what's TV? I watch it on my phone, right? And children don't watch TV, they watch it, so it's, I don't see things as a, t I, th I see them all in a, some kind of continuum. So what's, how, do we, how do we have some responsibility without with, with the danger that censorship um, uh, yeah. could limit and then effectively shut down uh, by, by putting in rules to try to encourage responsibility uh, uh, you could effectively shut down good communication. I think today I'm sort of a believer and I'm seeing, I think what we're seeing is, this, and, and as digital just massively expands, is that we're moving back to a subscriber-supported model. So one simple way to address this is to support news organizations that do the kind of work you believe in. And we're seeing this tremendous expansion of subscriptions uh, to uh, publications that people relate to. And I think, I think that might be one model is not whether it's for-profit or non-profit because we know NPR receives tremendous amount of support from the public. It's a non-profit, but um, for-profits do as well. So I don't think there's an easy answer, but we need to be talking about it more and the platform companies, it's not just the cable networks. I think it's Google, Facebook, and Twitter are the, are the sort of CBS, NBC, and um, ABC of today, and that they have struggled with what's our responsibility, and frankly, they've wanted to deny their responsibility, because why? Because they want to make as much money as possible, that's their job as corporations, and their single goal is engagement, use. We want to have as much use as possible, and whatever drives usage, for them is what's important, not necessarily um, what is of benefit to the country. The other thing I'd say quickly is that, you know, we tend to sort of make a baseline of whatever it is that existed when we were a certain age. And yeah. the second half of the 20th century uh, was a very, very unusual moment in American media, probably in media everywhere, which is that there were these massive networks uh, that had these kind of responsible anchormen. Uh, and uh, a lot of money that was feeding the whole system. Before then, uh, there was a much greater plethora of stuff, and there is now too. 
And that sort of level of raw competition is, I think, what we're going to have to get used to and figure out a way rather than kind of call on uh, responsibility of the sort of elders. I think we're going to have to come up with a subscriber model to get there. And there is a lot of value in this huge growth of media as well. I mean, you know, we can, if you want to know what's going on in Turkey, you don't just have to read the New York Times. You can go to the Turkish websites. Many of them are, appear in English and so forth. Another question, please. Right here down in the front, please. Thank you very much. Uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, one question is to you, sir. Uh, the um, media in the de developing democracies seems uh, more and more, especially televisions, personality driven. And it's, uh, most of the p television programs are about the person who runs that program more so than the subject matter. What should be done to enhance the quality of the, uh, these mediums? Otherwise, uh, it will turn into be, be, being blamed as fake news too. Uh, and to Ms. Ayubi, uh, while uh, this current government in Afghanistan may not be too media friendly, but do you think there's a, a field for collaboration between credible media and the government to identify and expose uh, mediums in Afghanistan who are being bought and paid by intelligence organizations of the neighboring countries. And they're infiltrating in a very big way in Afghanistan. Okay. Do you want to take your Two. question first or you want to think about yeah, it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think you've identified something real that these increasingly in American TV and probably abroad, there's a kind of personality. Uh, I. I'm not sure there's any way to stop that. So the only thing I can say is to get the best personalities possible and uh, to make sure that their production staffs are serious around them. Um, so you have someone like uh, Christiana Manpour. You know, I think you know, there are serious people doing it. Um, Wolf Blitzer, whoever it is. Uh, I think there are people who, you, who are interested in doing the right thing. And I don't think that they've become kind of personality cults. But the risk, you are right, is there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sultan Zoe, for your question. Mm, I think uh, the media that receiving uh, black money from the neighbors or from the, some uh, intelligence uh, organization outside country, uh, it, is, it is the reality of Afghanistan now. <laughs> and I know a network of 50 media, 5-0. I, I know them that daily their editorial comes from a neighbor country and they are paying them. And also the other network that they are also paying from the other neighbor. And many other uh, countries they have interest in, Afgh interest in Afghanistan, they are paying their own media. Uh, not, uh, it is, uh, actually it is not a clean support, it is a dirty uh, support. Uh, but uh, this is the job of Afghan government to control this money, to ask them from where you, you bought. Well, you know uh, better than me, uh, radio and TV in Afghanistan invested $9 million and they get it from our neighbors. And Afghan government have to ask them from where you get this money and why they paid you to invest this kind of uh, things. It is not a business. They know this is not a business. And the, and the government also know that a lot of uh, workers in the TV and radio are from our neighbor country. And they are selecting the people to work in this TV and radio. This is government uh, job. In the other case, what you said, uh, if uh, government is not, not so cooperative uh, with the uh, Afghan uh, credible uh, media, um, actually, law, the laws we have in the country, it is supporting us more than government. Because in, in the protection, which I uh, repeated two, three times, we have no protection from government side. And I think it has affected you because you are a government guy. Uh, this is, uh, sometime we have no protection, you know this. If I do some uh, sensitive reporting, I take the risk. And there is no support from government. But this is the laws are supporting us. 
And in the government case, I can tell you an example, one, one or two examples. Our radio station threatened and host to do broadcast some news which support army and police of Afghanistan. With that the advertisement came from the Ministry of Defense and uh, the Ministry of Interior, and we broadcast it as an advertisement because of the income. Uh, our reporters uh, treated in host that this, uh, the opposition said, we will kill all of you when you broadcast one time more this, uh, this one. And Ghazni be treated to do broadcast uh, classic music or uh, Indian music. And uh, Nengarhar we uh, attacked by two dam bam from ISIS. In three cases, we reported to Afghan police Ministry of Interior, NDS, and also other uh, related uh, organizations, but they didn't, re they just told us, write it in a letter. We just wrote it, and up to now they are quiet and no support from them. We have these examples which I mentioned these things. We are, well, I am talking on the base of evidence. Thank you. Take a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am, right here. The second woman here. I've become concerned that the American media is so Trump-obsessed that they've truly lost sight of so many other stories to be told at the local level and at the international level. And I'm wondering for our foreign journalists on the panel whether that leaves an opening for other media outlets to take a larger role. You'd like to ask the non-Americans on the panel? Well, my job is uh, requires covering uh, the Turkish media a lot, so I can't say I really follow the American media uh, in terms of finding out what's being missing in reports, really. So Ajiba, I'll have to excuse answer? myself no. from this question. No. Okay. John, but I mean, if you, if you talk to... Too bad the Americans are going to answer you. Go ahead. If you talk to students, I think you would find that many students read BBC or listen, you know, uh, use the BBC on the web. Uh, they, they like the BBC. Um, I, um, and, and also um, The Guardian, while it's struggling to some degree in America, it, it, it has an audience. Um, so there are um, some uh, English language foreign services. But I mean, as Ethan said, um, today, an American audience can read anywhere in the world. There's English publications. I mean, there's a, a wealth of international coverage. And I think Trump is an umbrella. I mean, you have to think about... I mean, he does suck the air out of the room, but if you think about... Uh, take the EPA and what's happening with the environment today. Well, that's Trump in the sense that the administrator was appointed by Trump. But it's not a Trump issue. It's about our environment and what our attitude to clean air and clean water is and what, what, a, what the appropriate degree of regulation of industry is and how, so, so I think there's a lot more coverage that's occurring. The issue with local press, frankly, is it's, it's because we used to have, say, 55,000 um, newspaper people in the United States and now we have 27,000. I mean, they've disappeared, I'm one of them. I closed the newspaper in Denver, Colorado. Um, and, and, and I've been in other newsrooms that were really struggling. Uh, two of the newspapers I've worked in in my life are dead. Um, and, um, yeah. you know, there's, and that is a serious, serious issue that uh, we don't have good local coverage. I'll just respond briefly and then I think I see Jim hovering, so maybe we need to move on. Um, Actually, I may add something oh, please, uh, to this, please. Uh, because I see this in Turkish media and in international media as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, stories are about this political leader said this outrageous thing, this yeah. political leader mm -hmm. said that, he said, she said, kind of reporting. And I think uh, I may be talking in a global sense in that the kind of reporting that distances itself from that, the, this politician said this, this politician said that, there may be an audience for people who are tired of that news. I think there is an audience and you're in it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that your concern is legitimate. I also think 
If you were in our shoes, you'd be doing the same thing, weirdly, right? In other words, this story is so overwhelming that this person came into power who seems to not fit the role in any way and who still seems to have a very loyal following and who is also inspired following among those who in theory hated him on the right but want to see him succeed. And all of the things around him, I mean, it's kind of an amazing story. And the whole question of the interference in the American election by the Russians and, you know, his children, it is overwhelmingly important and interesting, and on some level we're stuck with it. So uh, the good news <laughs> is you can also read Turkish newspapers and the BBC. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being a terrific audience and hand it back over to Jim Silkenet. Thank you.